Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Charlie Elphick. Number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am sure that the whole House will join me in condemning the appalling attack in Nairobi and in sending my thoughts and prayers to all those who have lost loved ones. Our High Commissioner has confirmed one British fatality and we are providing consular assistance to British nationals affected by the attack. We stand in solidarity with the Government and people of Kenya and will continue to offer our support to meet the challenge to security and stability that is posed by terrorism in the region. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Charlie Elphick. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. May I join with the Prime Minister in her strong condemnation of terror? Uh, and uh, you will know, Mr Speaker, and the Prime Minister will know, that I first sought election to this House because I believed in more jobs, lower taxes, a stronger economy, and more investment in the public services on which we all... Uh, rely and does she agree that since 2010 Conservative governments have delivered time and again for the British people and the biggest threat to that is sat on the opposition front bench who, with a leader whose policies would mean less jobs, higher taxes, a weaker economy and less investment in our public services. My, my honourable friend is absolutely right. What have we seen under the Conservatives in government? We have seen 3.4 million more jobs. That is more people earning an income, earning a wage, able to provide for their families. We have seen more children in good and outstanding schools, more money into our National Health Service. What would put that in danger? A government led by the right honourable gentleman, more borrowing, more taxes, more spending, fewer jobs. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. May I start by correcting the record? Last night I suggested this was the largest government defeat since the 1920s. I would not wish to be accused of misleading the House. Because I've since been informed that is in fact the largest ever defeat for a government in the history of our democracy. So, Mr Speaker, Shortly after the Prime Minister made her point of order last night, her spokesperson suggested the Government had ruled out any form of customs union with the European Union as part of her reaching out exercise. Can the Prime Minister confirm that is the case? Uh, can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that the exercise that I indicated last night is, as I said, about listening to the views of the House, about wanting to understand the views of parliamentarians, so that we can identify what could command the support of this House and deliver on the referendum. And what the Government wants to do is, first of all, to ensure that we deliver on the result of the referendum. That is leaving the European Union. And we want to do it in a way that ensures we respect the votes of those who voted to leave in that referendum. That means ending free movement. It means getting a fairer deal for farmers and fishermen. It means, it means opening up new opportunities to trade with the rest of the world. And it means keeping good ties with our neighbours in Europe. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, my question was about the customs union. The Prime Minister seems to be in denial about that, just as much as she's in denial about the decision made by the House last night. I understand the business secretary told business leaders on a conference call last night, we can't have no deal for all the reasons you've set out. Can the Prime Minister now reassure the House, businesses and the country and confirm that is indeed the government's position that we can't have no deal? I think that the point that the Business Secretary is making and that he has made previously is that if you don't want to have no deal, you have to ensure that you have a deal. Now, I will give this, I will give this to I will, I will say this to the right honourable gentleman. There are actually two ways of avoiding no deal. The first is to agree a deal, and the second would be to revoke Article 50. Now that would mean staying in the European Union to respect the result of the referendum, and that, is, and that is something that this government will not do. Jeremy Corbyn. Prime, 
Minister hasn't answered on a customs union, hasn't answered on, on no deal, and continues to spend £4.2 billion of public money on a no deal scenario. Yeah. Can't you understand? Yesterday the House rejected her deal. She needs to come up with something different than that. But, Mr. Speaker, it's not just on Brexit that this government is failing. Four million working people are living in poverty. Half a million more children in poverty compared to 2010. The Roundtree Foundation confirms in work poverty was rising faster than the overall employment rate. With poverty rising, can the Prime Minister tell us when we can expect it to fall? for the time she remains in office. Can I tell the right hon. Gentleman what is happening? We now see one million fewer people in absolute poverty. Under the, that, that is a record low. We see 300,000 fewer children in absolute poverty. That is a record low. We see a record low in the number of children living in workless households, and income inequality, income inequality lower than at any point under the last Labour government. That's Conservatives delivering for the people of this country. What would we see from the Labour Party? £1,000 billion more in borrowing and taxes, the equivalent of £35,000 for every household in this country. That's Labour failing to deliver for work people because working people always pay the price of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corby. In denial on a customs union, in denial on no deal, in denial on the amount of money being spent preparing for no deal, in denial on last night's result, and even the UN rapporteur on poverty says the government is... Well, Mr Speaker... Mr Speaker, it's very, it's very telling, very telling indeed, that as soon as I mention the report of the UN rapporteur who said the government was in a state of denial about poverty in Britain, Tory MPs start jeering. Tell that to people queuing up at food banks. The government too, Mr Speaker, has failed on children's education. Can the Prime Minister tell us what is her greatest failure? Is it that education funding has been cut by £7 billion, per pupil funding fallen by 8%, sixth form funding cut by a fifth, or that the adult skills budget has been slashed by 45%? Which is it, Prime Minister? Hundreds of free schools, a reformed curriculum, 1.9 million more children in good or outstanding schools, narrowing the attainment gap for disadvantaged children. This is a government that is delivering the education that our children need for their future. But I say to the right honourable gentleman, he says he talks about being in denial. The only person in denial in this chamber is him, because he has consistently, consistently failed to set out what his policy on Brexit is. I said to him last week I said to him last week that uh, he might do with a lip reader. I think when it comes to his Brexit policy, the rest of us need a mind reader. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is very well aware that we want there to be a customs union with the EU. She seems to be in denial about that. But one of the problems she has on her denial is the flagrant disregard for dis facts and statistics. And the Statistics Authority has written to the Department of Education four times to express their concern about the use of dodgy figures by her ministers. When police officers told the then Home Secretary not to make more cuts to police, that Home Secretary accused them of crying wolf. With 21,000 fewer police officers and rising crime across the country, does the Prime Minister accept that the then Home Secretary got it wrong? I say to the right honourable gentleman, of course, as we look at what is happening, particularly at what is happening on knife crime and ser serious violence, we recognise the need to uh, take action. That's why we've introduced the Offensive Weapons Bill, and it's why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has uh, introduced the Serious Violence Strategy. It's also, we are also making nearly £1 billion more available to police forces uh, over the next year. But I also say to the right honourable gentleman, Yet again, in all of these questions about public services, he only ever talks about the money that's going in. What matters, what matters with the police is the powers that we give them as well. And
And what was it? What was it? When we came to the issue of knife crime, when we came to the issue of knife crime, when we came to the issue of taking more action at criminals who were involved in knife crime, when we said that if somebody was caught on the streets for a second time for a knife crime, they should be sent to prison, what did the right honourable gentleman do? He voted against. He doesn't support our police. He doesn't support our security. Jeremy Corbyn. Increased the number of police on our streets. It was a Labour government that brought in safer neighbourhoods. It was a Labour government that properly funded the police force. It's the Tories that have cut it. Ask anyone on any street around this country, do they feel safer now than they did eight years ago? I think we all know what the answer would be. It was that Home Secretary that not only attacked the police with that, but also created the hostile environment and the Windrush scandal. She promised to tackle burning injustices. She's made them worse, as Windrush showed. More homelessness, more children in poverty, more older people without care, longer waits at A&E, fewer nurses, rising crime, less safe streets, cuts to children's education. This government has failed our country. It cannot govern, cannot command the support of most people facing the most important issue at the moment, which is Brexit. They failed again and lost the vote last night. Isn't it the case, Mr Speaker, that with every other previous Prime Minister faced with the scale of defeat last night, they would have resigned and the country would be able to choose the government that they want? The Right Honourable Gentleman, in that uh, peroration, talked about the importance of the issue of Brexit that is facing this country. Later today, we will have, we're going to have the no confidence debate. He has been calling for weeks for a general election in this country. And yet, on Sunday, when he was asked in a general election, would he campaign to leave the European Union, he refused to answer. Not once, not twice, not three times, but five times he refused to answer. So on what he himself describes as the key issue facing this country, he has no answer. The Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition has let anti-Semitism run riot in his party. He would abandon our allies, weaken our security and wreck our economy, and we will never let that happen. The Prime Minister will be aware of the Sirius Minerals project in my constituency that is already employing around 1,000 people and is set to boost British exports by £2 billion. From her visits to China, where she met the company's customers, she will know how how important this polyhalite fertiliser product can be around the world. The company is currently seeking a Treasury guarantee to complete its financing. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that this is precisely the sort of project the Government should be supporting to show our commitment to the Northern Powerhouse and the industrial strategy? Can I I say to my right honourable friend, uh, I'd like to thank you for raising this issue because I was uh, particularly pleased to meet the CEO CEO of Sirius during my trip to China and talk to them about the work that they're doing. And it is, as he says, exactly projects like this that drive investment and exports in the North that are what the Northern Powerhouse is all about. Now, in relation to the particular discussions my right honourable friend mentioned, I'm sure he'll understand these are commercially sensitive. So it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the specific discussions. But this, as I say, is exactly the sort of project that is what the Northern Powerhouse is all about, in driving investment, driving experts, good for the North. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the atrocity in Kenya and, of course, our solidarity with the people there? Mr Speaker, yesterday the Attorney General said that any new deal would be much the same as the one already on the table. We know that the European Union won't renegotiate. If the Prime Minister survives today to bring forward her Plan B, will she concede that Plan B will basically be a redressing of Plan A? As I said in one of my answers to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, what we want to do following the defeat that, uh, that we had in this House last night is listen to parliamentarians and find out the point at which uh, what is it that would secure 
the support of this House? That is the question that we will be asking, but that is against the background of ensuring that we deliver on the referendum result, that we leave the European Union and we recognise what people were voting for when they voted in that referendum result, an end to free movement, ensuring that we could have, trade, uh, negotiate, uh, have our own trade policy with the rest of the world, be fairer to our farmers, fairer to our fishermen, but maintain that good relationship with our neighbours in the EU. Ian Blackford. I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, that simply didn't address the question. The EU won't renegotiate. The Prime Minister has no answer. She has failed. What an omni shambles from this government, suffering a historic and a humiliating defeat, the worst for any UK government. Westminster is in chaos. But in Scotland, we stand united. Mr Speaker, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain, and we will not allow our country to be dragged out of the European Union or brought down by this Tory government. The Prime Minister knew that this deal was dead since Chequers. She knew it was dead when she moved the meaningful vote, and she knows, as we all know, last night was the last straw. The Prime Minister must now seek the confidence of the people, not simply the confidence of this House. The only way forward is to extend Article 50 and ask the people of Scotland and of the United Kingdom whether they want the Prime Minister's deal or whether they want to remain in the European Union. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister now must legislate for a people's vote. To the right honourable gentleman, as he knows, I, as, as, and as I have said before, this House legislated for a people's vote. It legislated for a people's vote that was held in 2016, and that vote, that vote determined that the United Kingdom should leave the European Union. He talks about our country. Our country is the whole of the United Kingdom. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and it is for the whole of the United Kingdom that we will be looking for a solution that secures the support of this House and ensures that this Parliament delivers on the vote of the people. Jeremy Lefroy. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker. On behalf of all the members of the All Party Group on Kenya, which I chair, and on behalf of my honourable friend, the member for Mid Derbyshire, the Prime Minister's trade envoy to Kenya, can we express our sincere condolences and sympathy to the President and people of Kenya yeah. and encourage them in their fight against this terrorism? Yeah. Um, my right, right honourable friend has rightly committed very, very substantial amounts of extra money to the NHS, her and her government, and the plan produced last week is very encouraging. But can she also look at the difference between the money given to the highest CCGs and the lowest CCGs per head. We are not wanting to see amounts come down, but we do want to see a fairer formula to allocate money for those CCGs receiving the lowest amount of funding. I thank my honourable friend for the remarks that he made uh, from his position as chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Group, as I understand it, on uh, Kenya. I was pleased when I visited Kenya last August to meet with some of those who are working to fight terrorism, doing very important work to bring stability and security to people in that region, and very important that is too. Um, First of all, I thank my honourable friend for highlighting the long-term plan that we have set out for the National Health Service. Uh, the, the resources allocated to CCGs reflect the needs of the population, and that includes levels of deprivation and the age, age profile of the population. And, uh, changes have been made to the allocations for 2019-20, increasing the fair share allocations for Staffordshire CCGs, which I am sure my honourable friend is particularly uh, interested in. And they will see a higher level of growth in their actual budgets over the next five years. And that difference will ensure that over time funding across the Staffordshire and Stoke on Trent CCGs will become fairer. So that biggest cash boost in the NHS's history is enabling us to do that. And I think that I hope that will be addressing the issue that my honourable friend has raised. Kyle. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Prime Minister's defeat yesterday was historic and titanic. Yeah. Everything has changed and she has to change too. Yesterday, thousands of people descended on Parliament Square to demand their say. Nobody was taken to the streets demanding a Norway or a Canada option. She, when she came to power, 
she promised that she would give people more power over their lives. If she is not going to give people power to have a say over this deal, then what is the point of that promise in the first place? I say to the honourable gentleman that he cannot ignore the fact that in the 2016 referendum, that in the 2016 referendum, the people of this country voted to leave the European Union. And I believe that it is a duty, not just of government, but of Parliament, to ensure that we deliver on that. We will be, we will be speaking to parliamentarians in my, my own party, the DUP, across the House, about uh, finding a way that secures the support of the House uh, for the way forward. But I say to the Honourable Gentleman once again, a vote was taken in 2016, and I believe it is incumbent on this Parliament to deliver on that vote. Trudy Harrison. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend will remember from her visits to Copeland just how capable our nuclear community is and how proud we are of that heritage. Yeah, 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 yeah. Would she consider meeting with me and a small delegation of Cumbrian nuclear workers to understand how important Muirside is to Copeland and to also bear in mind the solutions that the Centre of <coughs> Nuclear Excellence can bring to that challenge? Yeah. Yes. Well, can I thank my honourable friend? When I have visited Copeland, it's been very clear to me not only the expertise and skills that uh, in the nuclear industry that, that uh, are there with the population, but also the importance of the nuclear industry. Um, as regards the Moorside site, it, is, uh, it will revert to the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, and we are considering options for its future. It, the site does remain eligible for new nuclear nuclear new build, and we are committed to seeing new nuclear as part of our future energy mix. But uh, can I say to my honourable friend that I think it might be helpful if the relevant minister from the business department were to meet with her and that group to be able to explore this issue further. Seema Malhotra. Mr Speaker, last night in this House, after the biggest de government defeat in history, the Prime Minister said the government will approach meetings with parliamentarians in a constructive spirit. But it appears that cross-party talks means inviting people in to tell them why her deal is best or to see if they've got any ideas on how to get her deal through. <laughs> Apparently now, Number 10's resistance to a customs union with the European Union after Brexit was a principle and not a red line. So which is it? And if she is genuinely seeking to work with Parliament and hear the will of this House, is she prepared to change any of her red lines and work to bring Parliament and the country together on how we move forward? As I said in the House last night, I will be talking to parliamentarians on, in my own party, in the DUP, in other parties across this House, and will be, and will be ensuring and will be looking to see what it is that can secure the support of this House. But again, I say to the Honourable Lady, as I have said to her Honourable and Right Honourable friends, that what this House must always have in mind is the importance of delivering on the vote of the people to leave the European Union. And Mrs. Helen Grant. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that if we fail to deliver on Brexit, the public perception of politicians in this country will be at an all-time low? Yes. I, I, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. And this, and this is so important. I believe that if we fail to deliver on what the British people instructed us to do in the vote of the referendum, that the, uh, the, the views of the British people of this House, of Parliament and of politicians will be at an all-time low, because they will, have lost, they will have lost faith in politicians across the whole of this Parliament. We need to deliver Brexit for the British people. Dr Roberta Blackman-Woods. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister may have created a, bre a Brexit crisis, but other crises are unfolding too. Yeah. Chronic health conditions and obesity in the North East are the highest of any English region, and people in Durham over 65 can only expect eight years of health 
healthy living compared to 14 in Windsor and Maidenhead. So why on earth is the Prime Minister planning to cut Durham's public health budget by a massive 40 per cent that will not only worsen health outcomes of my constituents, it will ultimately cost the NHS more and further widen health inequalities. Well, I say to the Honourable Lady, of course, in terms of public health spend, uh, funding, that will be looked at in the spending review. But if she assumes that the only action that is taken in relation to obesity and other uh, conditions in terms of prevention is through public health, that is not the case. If she looks at the NHS long-term plan that has been uh, announced and looks uh, funded, of course, by the biggest cash boost in the NHS's history given by this government. What she will see is an emphasis on prevention and an emphasis on ensuring that people are able to lead healthier, independent lives for longer. Mr. Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I sat through uh, many hours on every day but one of the recent debate, and I did listen very carefully to the extraordinary range of views that was expressed on all sides throughout it. Uh, and it did seem to me that the only clear majorities in this House on a cross-party basis are firstly against leaving with no deal, uh, 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 again in favour of extending Article 50 to give us time to sort out what it is we now propose to do and in favour of a customs union, some form of customs union, and some sufficient regulatory alignment to keep all our borders between the United Kingdom and the European Union open after we leave. Will the Prime Minister not, just as I have had to accept that the majority in this House is committed to the UK leaving the European Union, that she must accept that she must now modify her red lines, which she created for herself at Lancaster House, and find a cross-party majority, which will be along the lines that I have indicated. My, my right hon. Friend started off by saying there were a considerable num- was a considerable number of views across this House. It is precisely because of that that we will be undertaking the discussions with members, uh, with parliamentarians, that I indicated would happen last night. That I indicated would happen last night. He talks about the uh, possible extension of Article 50. Of course, Article 50 cannot be extended by the UK. It has to be extended in, in uh, consultation, in agreement with the European Union. The government's policy, the government's policy, is that we're leaving the European Union on the 29th of March. But the, but the EU would only extend Article 50 if actually it was clear there was a plan that was moving towards an agreed deal. That, that is the crucial element of ensuring we deliver on Brexit, is being able to get the agreement of this House to the deal that will deliver on the referendum result, leave the European Union and recognise what lay behind that vote when people voted to leave. Graham Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In my constituency, in the villages of Easington, Colliery, Horden and Blackhall, yeah, yeah. there are colliery roads standing derelict, characterised by low demand, high void rates. Many are not fit for human habitation. They are neglected by absentee landlords, a magnet for antisocial behaviour and crime. So will the Prime Minister commit to provide the funding required for the housing master plan developed by Durham County Council to fix these issues. And if she can't do that, will she please get out of the way and call a general election? Let us have a Labour government that will address this. Can I say to the, uh, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I haven't seen the housing master plan that he, has, uh, that he has referred to, but of course it is this government, it is this government that has put more money into affordable homes, that has put more money into uh, ensuring that we're seeing more homes being built, and that, is, and that has lifted, lifted the cap on uh, local councils so that local councils are also able to build more homes and the homes that people want. Tracy Crouch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next month, I and my three neighbouring colleagues from Maidstone, Tunbridge Morning and Faversham Mid Kent will host our second apprenticeship fair, connecting nearly 40 leading organisations with more than 700 pupils from 22 schools. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that apprenticeships offer a viable alternative to full time higher education yeah, yeah. while creating a skilled wor- workforce that benefits business yeah, and its future yeah, employees? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
can I, can I first of all commend my honourable friend for the work that she's doing in her constituency through the jobs fairs? And can I absolutely agree with her? I think it is very important that young people are able to see that there are different routes for them for their futures, uh, different uh, routes into the workplace, and apprenticeships is an important uh, route for some young people. All the apprentices I meet say the best thing they have done is taken up an apprenticeship, and that was right for them. We want every young person to be able to take the route through, be it higher education, further education and apprenticeship, the route that is right for them. Yasmin Qureshi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the 60s and 70s, 1.2 million criminal skills were prescribed to women, including three of my constituents. Each dosage was equivalent to 40 oral contraceptives. Thousands of babies were born with deformities. A recent MHRA review is widely criticised for being a whitewash. Now, Professor Carl Halligan at Oxford University has published a review of the scientific data that clearly shows that criminals did cause deformities. Will the Prime Minister ensure that any response to this review does not involve the MHRA as we have no faith in them? Can I say, obviously, to the Honourable Lady, this is an important issue. It's been raised by a number of members from across the House, and uh, our priority always is on safety of patients, and members, uh, ministers are aware of the new uh, study that has come out. We have a commitment to review any new evidence in this area, and we do that, but we do it by co- with consulting independent scientific experts. And Baroness Cumberledge is leading the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review. That is expected to examine what happened in the case of Prima Dos and will determine what further action is needed. But can I reassure the Honourable Lady that we will listen very carefully to any recommendations that come out of the review, and of course uh, that study will be looked at very carefully to see what, comes, uh, what has come out of that study. Dr. Philip Lee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend, particularly since last night, recognise that in these complex circumstances, that her role as Prime Minister now is to create the political environment in which solutions to the Brexit conundrum can be found and not to continue with a plan expecting a different outcome? And does she also accept then that if she cannot get what she wants, that she will need to change her mind? in order to secure public confidence. Can I say to my honourable friend that, uh, as I have pointed out today and as I said last night, it is precisely because we recognise that we need to uh, understand rather better where it is that what it is that can command the support of this House and can secure the poise point of this House, that we will be looking and we will be talking to parliamentarians across the House. That includes parliamentarians, includes my colleagues, honourable and right honourable friends, includes the uh, Democratic Unionist Party and parliamentarians across other houses, because, as my right honourable and learned friend, the member for Rushcliffe, said, there is quite a variety of views across this House about what is right. Stuart Malcolm Macdonald. Mr Speaker, sir, the deal that was defeated last night is a product of her own red lines. So which of those red lines is she willing to give up in order to get the compromise she seeks? We will be, as I said last night, we will be approaching these talks, these discussions, in a constructive spirit. But underlying what we will be doing is the need to ensure that we deliver on the referendum result and we deliver Brexit. Raymond Chishti. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome the recent statement by the Foreign Office. Britain must do more to support persecuted Christians. In light of that, will the government now review its position on the Asher Bibi case and offer her asylum in the UK so she can choose which safe destination she wants to go to and not the UK asking a third country to take her in, which would mean shifting our moral responsibility to another country, and that can't be right. Can I, I hope, reassure my honourable friend by saying that, as I have said previously, our primary concern is for the safety and well-being of Asia Bibi and her family. And uh, obviously, the UK's High Commissioner in Islamabad is keeping me and the government up to date with developments. We have been in contact with international partners about our shared desire to see a swift and positive resolution in this case. And a number of countries are in discussions about a possible alternative destination for Asia Bibi once the legal process is complete. I'm I'm not going to comment on the details of that because this is, uh, we do not want to compromise Asia Bibi's long term safety. Uh, and on the timing, I think the Foreign Minister from Pakistan has confirmed she will remain under the protection of the Pakistan government until the legal process has concluded. 
and the Prime Minister of Pakistan has supported the Supreme Court and promised to uphold the rule of law. What matters is ensuring that we are providing for the safety and well-being of Asia Bibi and her family. Ronnie Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has said in a recent survey that four million in-work workers are living in poverty. Isn't that a damning report of nine years of this Tory government? And will she stop being so hard and fast and call a general election? Here it is. I say to the honourable gentleman, I, I referred earlier to the figures of uh, people in absolute poverty, which are at a record low under this government. Uh, but he talks about people who are in work. What well, this government has taken a number of steps, a number of steps to help those people who are in work. We have been cutting, cut taxes for 32 million people. We've increased the national uh, living wage. We've helped people by freezing fuel duty. And what happened? What happened in a number of the measures that we have taken to give to give financial help to people who are just about managing, to people the sort of people he's talking about. Unfortunately, in so many cases, the Labour Party opposed those measures. Martin Vickers. Mr Speaker, in an article I posted on my website in November, I, put, I concluded by saying hopefully we will eventually come to a position that both sides who support the agreement and those like me who oppose it can coalesce. I believe this could happen over coming weeks, though there may be more drama before we reach that point. Mr Speaker, I think we've all had our fair share of drama, but would my right honourable friend agree, agree with me that it's not both sides, meaning remain and leave, who must coalesce around an agreement, it is the European Union. And can I urge her to continue uh, negotiations with Europe in, in the hope of them showing some flexibility? Can I, can I thank my honourable friend for pointing out a very, what is a very obvious point, but actually has been not been raised by those who have been talking about the sort of discussions we will have across this Parliament, which is, I want to see what will secure the support of the House, but of course we do have to ensure that that can secure the support of the European Union, because this is a treaty and agreement between two parties. And as I said last night, uh, once we have uh, those ideas from the, uh, from the House, I will of course take those to the European Union. David Crosby. In March 2010, Greater Manchester Police had 8,148 police officers and the Chief Constable wanted 10,000. By June 2018, we had 6,199 and the numbers are still going down. Incidents of crime are rising right across Bolton. And is it any wonder, and more importantly, Mr Speaker, is it acceptable that the police are failing to attend violent attacks and systematic drug dealing locations. Yeah. 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 I say to the honourable gentleman, as I indicated earlier, we have, as a government, made more money available to uh, police for forces. Uh, next year, uh, nearly a billion pounds extra will be available to, uh, to police forces. Uh, but it isn't just, of course, about the money that's available to police forces. It is about the power that the police have, and uh, it's, that is why we have been introducing the Offensive Weapons Bill. It's why we continually take action to make sure that the police have the power they need to keep us safe. Nikki Morgan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Further to her point of order last night and the questions asked so far at this question time, does my right honourable friend agree that we all need to maintain maximum flexibility if we are to build a consensus around Brexit in this House? Yes, as I said last night, we will approach the discussions we will have with honourable members and right honourable members across this House with, uh, in a constructive spirit. The, the one, uh, and as I said earlier, what we do need to retain, though, as we're looking at those uh, discussions to find what will secure the support of the House, is to remember that what we are doing is finding a way to deliver Brexit and deliver on the vote of the British people. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I don't like to worry the Prime Minister, but it is notable that I had a question at David Cameron's final PMQs. <laughs> Last night, after the Prime Minister's crushing defeat, she said, EU citizens who have made their home here deserve clarity on these questions as soon as possible. Mr Speaker, the clarity is in the Prime Minister's own hands, so will she now show leadership Prove that she values EU nationals, scrap the settled, yep. the settled status yep. fee, 
and give a guarantee to all EU nationals that their future in the UK is secure. I say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, the withdrawal agreement that was negotiated with the European Union set out the ways in which EU citizens' rights would be guaranteed here in the United Kingdom and reciprocal rights for UK citizens in the European Union would be guaranteed. Now, the vote last night rejected that package of the withdrawal agreement and the, uh, and the political declaration. We have said as a government and made it clear that in a no-deal situation we would also guarantee the rights of EU citizens who are living here, and we stand by that. Gillian Keegan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No country has ever left the EU using Article 50, so I do not underestimate the challenge. But back in the real world, businesses up and down the country, with the possible exception of Weatherspoons, are extremely <laughs> disappointed with last night's vote. And short term investment decisions are still on hold or going against the UK. Would the Prime Minister agree that protecting just in time supply chains, on which my constituents' jobs depend, must be at the heart of any solution? Yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend that she has raised a very important point? Because, of course, what the deal we put to Parliament last night, one of the things it did do was to protect those just in time supply chain models, and our position on their importance has not changed. Uh, today, as we look ahead to today's vote, backing the government today will enable us to find a way forward on Brexit and on the issues, as she says, that matter at home, and ensure that this country has the government it needs to take it forward, uh, to take it forward, to deliver on the referendum, and, as she says, ensure that we are protecting the jobs not just of her constituents, but jobs around the whole of this country. Yeah. Yeah. D. Lucas, yeah, yeah. will the nuclear power station is it 20 billion pound? UK Japan trade deal of vital importance to North Wales, to North West England, and to UK energy policy as a whole. Did the Prime Minister discuss its difficulties with the Prime Minister of Japan last week? And if not, why not? Yeah, yeah. We, have been, we have been working uh, with Hitachi, we have been working with the Government of Japan, and yes, I did raise the issue of the Wilfa uh, uh, site with the Prime Minister of Japan last week. Of course, the company involved will be making a commercial decision in relation to this matter. The Government has been in discussion with them for some time, has been providing uh, support. We do want to see new nuclear as part of our energy mix in the future. We also have to make sure that the cost of any energy that is provided by nuclear is at a, a a reasonable level for the consumer. Kirsten Hare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recently welcomed the news from the Secretary of State for Defence and his ministerial team that, in fact, 45 Commando would remain at RM Condor in my constituency. Yeah, yeah. And Zulu Company, part of the 45 Commando group, recently took part in specialist chemical training, which will ensure they are ready to respond first to any chemical or biological attacks such as the one that we had in Salisbury earlier uh, last year. Can the Prime Minister join with me in congratulating the Royal Marines at 45 Commando, all the men and women that work at the base, for the tireless work that they do to keep our country safe? Yeah. Well, can I, can I uh, say to my honourable friend, I'd like to thank her for raising this issue. I know uh, she has raised this in her Westminster Hall debate because it's of importance to her, but it's also of importance to many other members around this House. And I would like to pay tribute to all the Royal Marines, past and present, yeah. who served in RM Condor. And I'm pleased to say that we do plan for 4 5 Commando to remain based at RM Condor Barracks in Angus. We'll ensure they continue to have the required facilities for them to live, work and train in Angus. And I'm delighted in joining my honourable friend in congratulating Zulu Company for their hard work in keeping us safe. Mr. Cable. Uh, can I, first of all, welcome the Prime Minister's offer of cross-party talks? And she will remember, as we're former colleagues, that my party has a record of working with others in the national interest. <laughs> but can I... <laughs> say to her that she shouldn't even bother lifting the telephone to opposition parties unless she's willing to rule out categorically a New Deal Brexit, unless she's willing to enter into a constructive conversation about a people's vote. Say to the uh, to the right honourable gentleman, as I said earlier, of course there are two ways of avoiding a no deal. One is to have a deal, and one is to stay in the European Union. We will not be staying in the European Union, uh, but I look forward to having. I'm always, I'm always, I'm happy to have constructive discussions with party leaders who want to put the national interest first. Sadly, from everything I've heard, not every party leader wants to do that. Dr. Sarah Wallister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Um, driving off a cliff never ends well, um, particularly if it results in a crash and burn Brexit with no deal in just 72 days' time. But there's another way that we can avoid this, and that is to be realistic in extending Article 50 to allow us to put a realistic negotiated Brexit direct to the British people, to yeah, ask if it has yeah. their consent, when also to include an option to remain with the excellent deal we already have. To my honourable friend, as, as she will not be surprised to hear, because I've said it this, uh, uh, in Prime Minister's questions today. I believe we should deliver on the vote of the referendum in 2016. That we should be delivering Brexit, as I've indicated earlier to her. Uh, the, uh, uh, she and others have talked about extending Article 50. Uh, the European Union would only extend Article 50 in the circumstances in which it was going to be possible to come to an agreement on a deal. The talks that we will be having, the discussions I'll be having with parliamentarians across this House will be aimed at ensuring that we can find a way to secure a deal that will get the support of this House. Order.